felt more like a parade. It felt like, I don't know, just maybe like a big 4th of July soiree. And so I had a good time and I, you know, put my face in the Uncle Sam or Aunt Samantha or however you want to say it. Uh, it put my face in the cutout and ended up in the Columbus Dispatch. So I thought that was pretty fun. Here's my presentation, sorry guys. All right, strategic research. Uh, pull this guy here. Strategic research can also be called opposition research, okay? And um, we're, this could be many things. You could be researching an organization. You could be researching a group. For example, I know a lot of citizen journalists who wanted to consume as much information as possible about the Occupy movement. And they were researching and investigating. So they, in that case, were researching a group. Um, you could research a candidate, someone who's running for office, right? Because a lot of times, um, we feel like the mainstream media doesn't properly vet candidates, and so it's up to us to do kind of some background research and find out who these people are who want to represent us uh, in Congress or at the local level. So we can um, vet candidates, or you know maybe there's just a local businessman in your town or your community who has started buying up a lot of property. Um, maybe he's bought a whole strip of businesses right on Main Street, and you're kind of wondering, who is this guy who just moved into town six months ago and is all of a sudden buying property, right? These are kind of questions that we think of when we are um, living in our communities and, and that's when I think it's important to dig down deep and do some strategic research. Uh, now, I'm really excited about this. I have become a little bit of a research nerd. Um, there have, may or may not have been a few Saturday nights where I sat at home with my laptop and a glass of wine and did a little bit of digging, so I think it's fun. And uh, you can get off on a lot of different rabbit holes. I think you might jump on a website and think, oh, I'm really going to look at you know, school budget numbers right now. And then two hours later, you're on pensions, and you're just in a completely different place. So there are a lot of rabbit holes out there, um, but it's exciting. Uh, and there is really so much information on the internet, and I'm talking free information. I'm not even talking about paid services. The amount of information you can find out about a person, or a group, or a piece of legislation. Um, we just have so much available to us uh, with the internet. and. And you know, it's, it's funny, I know who, I think it was uh, John this morning who was talking about how, you know, there really, there's, there's no credential to be a journalist. You know, he said, you don't, you don't have to have gone to journalism school. Anybody can really report. All you need to do is take notes and ask questions and be a proper reporter. Well, I feel the same way about research, where if you have a computer and an internet connection, you have the world at your feet. You really do. And I'm going to show you um, a few great examples uh, of how we can dig down deep. Uh, it's to the point now where I have a few friends who will come to me and say, oh, Mary Ellen, you know, I'm dating someone new. I was wondering if I could give you his name and maybe you'll do a little research for me. So um, it's fun, it's fun and you can get really, really good at it. But first I wanna, I just kinda wanna talk to you about, I guess the reason why I think it's so important to do research uh, and that's because we want to hold people accountable and we want to make them live up to their own standards because so many times in society people will say one thing, they will preach to you what they believe and you want to believe them. We do. You know, we want to believe in the American principles that they preach and, and we want to believe that they're family oriented and, um, and that they have the best interests in mind for our communities, but they don't always and that's a sad reality, but that's why it's our job um, it's our job to do the background check. You know, what really um, frustrates me is, you know, the ones who, let's like, say for example, Al Gore. He wants to tell you how to live your life. He wants to tell you how, you know, you know, what, um, you know, what types of, uh, of uh, you know, how you, you know, how much energy you can use in your home. He wants to tell you what kind of cars you can drive, what type of light bulbs that we can use, right? He wants to regulate uh, very specific things about your lives. And yet, 
And yet, there's a lot of things about Al Gore's lifestyle that have come out in the news, which um, are very disturbing and are in fact the exact opposite of what he preaches. So that's what I think we're looking for. We're not necessarily looking for the, um, you know, yeah, I want to dig up dirt and find out, you know, what he did when he was six years old. He pulled the pigtails of the girl sitting behind him in class. I don't really care about that. But what I do care about is, are you a man of your word? Do you, do you do what you say? Do you say what you mean? That's what I care about. And so when I'm digging for research, I'm looking for um, someone who does not live up to his own standards. Uh, and I just like to start with that because you know sometimes you can find things and maybe sh stretch it into something that isn't quite really a story, but you want it to be a story. In this case, I'm looking for someone who does not live up to his own standards. Uh, and we want to identify them as hypocrites and then expose them to the public. So that would be the ultimate goal uh, or initiative. So how do we do that? Um, the first and easiest way is to produce a document. And I know you have all heard us talk over and over today about documents. Uh, and, and you have to start thinking with, I call it a document state of mind. Uh, in today's world, like I mentioned earlier, there is a document for everything, uh, particularly in government organizations. Uh, if there's a meeting, there are meeting minutes. You know, it's particularly in government agencies, there are memos for things. There, I mean, there's so many, so many meetings, but there's a document for pretty much everything that happens. And we go on about our daily lives, and we just think, oh, huh, I noticed that there's a new road that was put in down the street. Huh, oh, that's nice and we keep going about our merry little way. And part of being an investigative reporter is learning to think differently. So, for example, you know, let's say you happen to be driving on your way to work and you notice there's a new construction project on your normal route to work, and most people would continue to drive on by and say, oh, hmm, there's a building or something coming up over here. But I want you to start asking questions. Well, what is that new building that's popping up? Is it a stimulus project? If so, how much money was given? Is it taxpayer money? Is it coming from, you know, is it federal money or is it state money? You know, you wanna find out, is this a public project or a private pro project? So um, we, we need to start thinking differently, um, asking questions. Another example would be, um, you know, on a university, on a, a campus, for example. Let's say a, an academic building used to be called uh, the Tom Jones Building of Science and Arts. And all of a sudden, it was changed to the Bill Smith Building of Science and Arts. And you know, students are walking around on campus and they may think, oh, hmm, we changed the name of the science building. All right, and they keep walking. But what I want you to do is to start thinking, well, who is this Bill Smith guy? Is he an alumni? Did he give a large gift of money? If so, how much? Was it public record? Did he go to the school? You know, is he, is he a native to the state? Um, these are all really, really important questions. And it could just be, hey, he's a really great guy who wanted to give back to his university. That's what it could be, end of story. But it could be something deeper. And we'll never know unless we ask questions and we look for those documents. You know, there's, you're born, there's a document. You buy a house, there's a document. You get married, right? We have a marriage license. There is a document for everything, and so we need to start looking and thinking how we can get a hold of those, because once you have that document, you have proof. You're no longer a crazy conspiracy theorist, right? You're no longer a blogger who just decided to write your opinion. You have proof. So this open records request stuff that we talk about today, I can't emphasize enough. Uh, how just how important it is um, So the next thing I would say is to do let's let's say we're researching a person Okay, so we'll, we'll just talk about a person in uh, for today's lecture Start by doing I say kind of like a brain dump and you ask yourself. What do I know about this person? Are they married? Do they have children? If so, where do their children go to school? Is it at a publicly funded school or in a university or um, is it maybe a Catholic parochial school? Um, is this person military? Have they served, um, have they served the country? Um, is this person own a gun? Has this person invented something and maybe has a patent? So just start thinking everything that you know. Are they a lawyer? If so, they had to take the bar somewhere. Which state did they take it in? 
Okay, these are all just on the top of my head, but you could dig in so much deeper. Um, is this person a businessman? Uh, how did he acquire his wealth? Is it family money, or has he, is he self-made and has owned several businesses? So these are just beginning questions that when you first start to research someone, you want to think, what do I know about this person? And just write it all down and just start brainstorming. The second thing you want to do is create a Google alert. How many people have heard of a Google alert? A couple? You know, I, at first I didn't include this in my presentation because I thought, oh, everybody knows what a Google alert is. But everybody does it, is what I've learned. So just really quickly, um, I have what are people saying about themselves. So a Google alert, ultimately, I will click on this little link and take us there. Uh-oh. Aha, OK. So let's say you wanted to research Mary Ellen Beattie. I'm kind of a shady character. You want to see what I'm up to. I live out in DC and fly to all across the country every weekend and tell citizens what to do. So if you wanted to research me, you could enter into the search query you see right up here. You'd enter Mary Ellen Beattie. And anything that came up on the internet with my name on it, whether it was a news article or a blog post, let's say Chris McCoy took a picture of me standing up here and she put it on Facebook, that would pop up. Anything that, that comes on the internet that has the word Mary Ellen Beattie, you can then track and it will be emailed right to your email account. You don't even have to do the work. So then it says result type. Do you want everything on me or do you want just a news article? Do you want just a blog post? Do you want just video? So you can choose uh, and specify. Okay, and then how often do you want it? Um, if you decide to follow someone of prominence per se, you, let's say you decide you want to follow Paul Ryan, your email inbox is gonna explode because Paul Ryan's getting quite a bit of name identification in the news these days. So if you don't want to get an email, you can either choose as it happens, meaning the second it, that's as it happens, the second it ends up on the internet, I want to see it, okay? Or the second option is once a day. So once a day, send me all the articles that pop up about Mary Ellen Beattie. Or you can do once a week, it's kind of your preference. And then um, how many, only the best results or all results, you can kind of tailor to whatever you need here and then you click create alert and you have a Google alert and it will be emailed to you regularly. Question. Can you find out how many people have you as their Google alert? Ooh, no one has asked me that before. I'm not sure. Um, I don't, think, I don't think there's a way to know that. Nope, but you definitely want to create a Google alert about yourself. Um, you definitely want to do that because let's say, I know you are all are very active in your communities and you go to public meetings and you're a part of the Tea Party movement and um, we know that some people are not favorable to the Tea Party movement and like to single out members of the Tea Party movement uh, and if someone says something about you online, you want to know about it so that you can, um, you can find whatever it is that they're saying, you can counter it. If they say, oh, well, I'm, I, Mary Ellen Beattie, um, she's a Tea Party racist. If somebody had said that about me online, I would want to know about it because, again, you can respond and say, well, here's all the things that I believe as a Tea Party member. Would this be a search into Facebook? What's that? Does it search into Facebook? Um, we will get into Facebook search, a much, much better way to do it. But yes, it will pull up certain things from Facebook. It's not very comprehensive, but it will pull up a few things. Not emails, nope. This is just um, online in the public sphere, whatever is posted online somewhere. Not retro, only from here forward? No, right. no backwards. Um, well, you can change the date if you want. You can search Google News, um, and that's very easy. So like when you go to google.com, let's just back off a little bit. And you can like search Google News. Have you guys ever done that? No. It's very similar to like Yahoo News. And you're able to search by date and you can go back. Mm -hmm. And I can show you how to do that if you want to stick around later. Okay, so I'm getting off on a couple tangents here. Let me go back to my. Yes, Google. Oh, yeah. All right, so next. Um, 
friends and allies, who are they closely associated with? You know, my grandmother had a saying that I still remember to this day, and she, when I was a very little girl and I was making friends at school, and I was upset because there was another girlfriend of mine who, I don't know, who knows, stole my lunch or something. And she said, you know, Mary Ellen, you choose your friends wisely because you become like those around you. And I thought, huh, kind of stuck with me. So anyways, um, I think that the people that we're associated with say something about ourselves. Uh, and in this case, as you can see on the pic, or, or maybe you can't see because the sun's kind of coming in, but uh, there's President Obama with um, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, and we all remember when the news story broke of, you know, oh, here we have um, his Reverend Pastor, who he himself said that this man was like a, was like a father to him, that he was a mentor to him. Okay, those are some very strong words. And, and this is a man who, when we started looking at some of his sermons more closely, he said things like, we shouldn't say, God bless America. We should say, excuse me, God damn America. And so I think that's significant. You know, here's a man who's going to be the president of the United States and a person that he calls his friend, his mentor, and someone who is like a father to him. We, I think we deserve to know something about him. And, um, and I honestly believe, and this is just my personal opinion, that this may have been a bigger news story, but when it first broke, I think, um, I think conservatives were afraid of being called racist. And so they didn't pursue the story. They just, they let it drop. And if we would have really maybe dug a little more deeper and found out to what extent President Obama was involved in this church, you know, to what extent was uh, Jeremiah Wright involved with his family, uh, I think it may have been a, a bigger news story and have had more influence than it did. Okay. So next, online resources. Do your homework. Uh, so in addition to, so when we're uh, looking up friends and allies, Wikipedia, everybody knows, right? Usually it links right there to me, hang on. Hang on. All right, that's, these guys decide they're not gonna wanna work today. Right. Oh, here we go, they are here, I'm sorry. Okay, so Wikipedia which you all know and love. Um, just the only reason I even bring this up, and we'll fly this through this really quickly, is um, there is something called source notes in Wikipedia. So let's look up someone we all know. Like, how about Eric Holder? Sorry. Um, so a lot of information about Eric Holder that we already know, but if you scroll all the way to the bottom, it's got a lot of info here. It says references, or also called source notes. Um, and right there, I just think that's a good start. If you wanna research someone, the references part of Wikipedia is a great place to start because they're gonna give you um, articles and links and studies and annual reports. Uh, gonna, I, usually it's a pretty good variety you're gonna get um, from all sides of the political spectrum. So it's a good place to start and the, the research is already done for you. So I highly recommend using the references section of Wikipedia. These are all populating. Okay, the next one is Facebook search. I got it pulled up right here. Okay, so Facebook search is really, really fun. Um, if you want to search something on Facebook, this is, this is perfect, you use this uh, platform, but you don't have to be friends with anyone. You can search and find information. So let's type in Occupy DC. What's the URL for that? Um, let's go back, it's just www.fbsearch. Www Dot us, and you'll get all of these links. So now, as you can see, I'll scroll down. Anybody who has mentioned Occupy DC on Facebook, whether I'm friends with them or not, I have this huge long list of people who have mentioned Occupy DC. 
And they could say, Occupy DC is the worst thing that's ever come, you know, these people have no cause and they don't even know what they stand for, okay? Or they could say, hey, we're having an Occupy DC, you know, secret underground rally next Tuesday night and, you know, invite as many people as possible, okay? So you're going to get anybody who mentions that phrase, Occupy DC. Um, and we actually use this quite a bit. We sent our interns. We had them research with Facebook search, find all the rallies that were happening, and had them go and record footage with their video cameras. So that's how we found out what was happening was we just looked on Facebook. It's amazing what people will tell you on Facebook. I found that this works really well um, on local issues. You know, we're going to talk about the severance tax later today. And let's say you were trying to find other people who were champ, you know, who were um, trying to educate or promote or oppose or whatever the severance tax. You can find these people on Facebook. So let's type in severance tax. Oh, look at that. We got a couple. Not a whole lot. Maybe if I take out Ohio. Let's try that. Yeah, quite a few more people here. And so if you were looking for, let's say you wanted to host a meeting and educate people about the severance tax, and you wanted to get everybody in one room, but you don't know who supports it and who opposes it, this would be a good way to identify those people. And then you could send them a message on Facebook and say, hey, we're gonna host an educational seminar on the severance tax. I noticed that you posted something about it on Facebook, thought you might be interested in attending. Okay, so it's a great way to find people on local issues. All right, and I need to move a little bit quicker here. Okay, so lifestyle. Do they practice what they pe preach? I had mentioned earlier Al Gore. Um, what was just so frustrating to me, again, was Al Gore, you know, he's preaching energy efficiency, and we come to find out, I don't know if you guys remember the big story that broke, was his vacation home in Tennessee um, had a utilities bill where he was spending $30,000 uh, in utility bills a year, which I don't know how much you guys spend a year in utility bills, but uh, <laughs> mine is nowhere near $30,000. And on top of that, um, if you want to talk carbon emissions, um, his carbon emission level was 20 times higher than the average household. Um, and so, again, you want to talk about lifestyle. Um, do they claim that they are a family man, you know, very family oriented, and then you find out that actually this person has a, quite a promiscuous past. You know, that's a case of someone who does not live up to the standards that he claims. Um, is this a person who um, maybe preaches, um, you know, preaches poverty? Oh, I think it's, you know, very important that we're humble and we give to charity and those rich, evil millionaires, they don't know anything about the working class. And then you come to find out that, again, he has a vacation home, a very expensive one on an island somewhere. So you want to look at their lifestyle, not because, not because you know, we think their lifestyle is going to have an effect on how they vote, but because, again, if they claim to live one way and, and then we find out that they live another, we want to expose that. Okay, so the next is education. Do they exaggerate their academic record? So you want to ask yourself, where did they go to school? And what type of a degree did they get? Are they qualified for the job that they're applying for? I think so often um, people just assume that um, resumes are correct. And in fact, uh, we found that, that people exaggerate their qualifications quite a bit. Um, and, and we want to be able to double check that. So. Uh, also with education, we want to find out who were their professors. Um, you know, again, with President Obama, we had the, the professor, Derek Bell, was his Harvard Law professor, if you all remember. Um, he studied something called critical race theory, and I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it has a very, um, if you research critical race theory, uh, it has a very strong influence in the way that someone views the American democratic system and, and what our laws mean in this country. Uh, and, and we know that President Obama uh, went to a rally with Derrick Bell on critical race theory. I think, again, that's really important to find out who his intellectual uh, inspiration, inspirations and leaders were. Um, 
You also want to look up if this person has any published articles or if they wrote a thesis. Um, definitely want to get your, your hands on those. And a lot of this happens in college, maybe an old college essay or paper that someone wrote. A lot of times those are published online and you want to get your hands on that. Um, you also want to verify dates. And so this website here, we will click. Yeah, now it's working. It's called the National Student Clearing House. And if you Googled that, that would pop up for you. And the National Student Clearing House will, will verify dates for you um, so, and majors as well. So if you want to find out when somebody went to a particular institution, um, you can find out that information here. And, and I know the one case that, um, where this might be interesting, other than verification, is let's say somebody took off two years from school. You just noticed that when you looked at the, or they had a sudden transfer, you might ask questions as to why did that person transfer a university. You know, maybe they had drug issues and were kicked off of a, a sports team or, you know, you never know. And sometimes it's interesting to look and find out. It could just be that the person's mother got sick and they took two years off of school to take care of their sick mother. And that's honorable, right? But it could be something more. It could be that they got into trouble with the law and they had to take two years off of school because they ran into some law troubles. So you never know. It's always, um, it's worth researching for sure. Uh, next is family background. Are they who they say they are? Um, we have the example here, as you can, I don't know if you guys can see, sorry, we've got some light in the background, but that's Elizabeth Warren, okay, candidate for U.S. Senate in Massachusetts, and if you want, in, in, on the side here, that's a, a Cherokee Indian kind of standing on the top of a, of a mountain, and if you know the story that um, Guy Benson from Town Hall. If you don't already, if you don't read Town Hall, or if you don't know him, he's a good person to start reading his work. I just think he's uh, a, a very, a very great writer. So, anyways, he covered this story quite extensively. And Elizabeth Warren, when she was at Harvard Law, uh, all of the institutions require that there. It's a federally mandated. You have to, you have to um, report diversity statistics. So this is federally mandated at every university. I don't know why it matters. I don't know why we care, you know, what types of students are at what universities, but every university has to keep diversity statistics. And these statistics are self-reported, okay? So you ask the student, what ethnicity are you? And they, they self-identify themselves and they check a box. Well, when Elizabeth Warren was at Harvard Law School, multiple years in a row, she checked that she was a minority, that she was Native American, uh, and she claimed uh, of the, the Cherokee tribe. Well, nobody ever really questioned her on this because that can be a little dicey when we question people on their ethnic background, right? We don't, we don't want to talk about that subject. It can be touchy. But she started using it and mentioning it in her political career quite often to the point where the Cherokee tribe themselves politely stood up and said, oh, do you, know, do you have any family records or do you have anything that you can verify your Cherokee heritage? And she didn't, she really didn't. And when you read the full story, she had some ridiculous arguments. One of them was that, well, my, gran my grandfather had very high cheekbones like the Cherokee Indians do. Oh. And if you look at the photos of my, grand, my great great grandfather, he has very high cheekbones. I mean, that's not really, in my opinion, that's not a, a credible record of whether or not she has Native American heritage. And if you go on to read, she talks about family recipes and just all kinds of things that really are not a good indicator. And, and again, you know, some may say, oh, well, I don't care what her ethnic heritage is. That has nothing to do with how she would vote or if she'd be a good politician. But what matters to me, and I don't know about you, is if she's using that as political gain, if she's using that to try to further her political career, you know, I think that says something about her character. Uh, and again, we want these people to live up to their own standards. If you're gonna say that you're of Cherokee background, we wanna know that you are, in fact, of Cherokee background. Okay, next, military record. Uh, where did they serve? So you all remember, John Kerry and how the Swift Boat veterans outed him in his military record. Okay, um, let me squeeze through here. There we go. Um, and again, you know, all you know, all service members, you know, whether they're in the front line shooting or whether you're sitting at a desk doing operations work, 
all of our soldiers are important, but it, you know, my husband's in the military, he's actually over in Afghanistan right now, so I certainly have great respect for the military, but, um, no, thanks. <laughs> Um, no, but, it, but I will, thanks. But again, if you're using your military background and record to advance your political career and you're exaggerating it in a dishonest way, that's something that we want to call these people out on. Um, or another example may be if someone says that they are supportive of the military, you know, you want to challenge, are they really supportive? So here's a great example um, from my college days. I went to Marquette University in Wisconsin and um, they claimed that they were pro-military and they supported uh, you know, all the alumni who were veterans. However, you know, I had heard through the grapevine that they had given the ROTC group quite a bit of trouble, had kind of tried to kick ROTC off campus, and of course none of this was public, but you, know, you, you hear rumors and things. So every year they did something called you know, you know, Mission Week. And this particular year, Mission Week was called Constructing Peace. And every student group was supposed to talk about what their interpretation of constructing peace was. Okay, so the college Republicans that year decided, well, sometimes you have to achieve peace through war. And so they set up a table um, and they had a big banner that said, Adopt a Sniper. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of, there's a group called Adopt Sniper where you can give money to help um, give better body armor to soldiers. And so here in the middle of Peace Week, where everybody has a table set up, this particular group had a huge banner that said, Adopt a Sniper. And of course, you know, the university came running, I think it was up for maybe 10 minutes, came running to the table and took down the banner and shut down the whole table and said that they were being disrespectful to Mission Week. Well, as soon as uh, veteran alumni found this out, they were very upset. They started pulling donations from the university. They started writing letters to the local newspaper, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, they started calling in and said, I'm not giving one more dime until I you know, I know that this university respects the military. So that was a great example of how the students called out the administration as hypocrites. They said, you know, you say that you support the military, but we don't believe it because you've tried to kick off ROTC off the campus. So that was a way that they held them accountable. I like to tell that story because again, just because somebody says they're supportive doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Uh, favoritism. Okay, um, do they make exceptions for some and not for others? You remember we talked about the parking ticket example this morning. Right? That was an example of favoritism where the local law enforcement were excusing parking tickets for some and not others. Um, you all remember when Obama was running in 2008 and one of, his big, uh, one of his big campaign liners was he always said, super PACs inhibit democracy. Right, He said that quite a bit. <laughs> super PACs inhibit democracy over and over and over and I will not show favoritism you know, if I'm president. <laughs> so, um, the White House visitor logs are actually posted online for everyone to see. There used to be a time when reporters had to file a Freedom of Information request to, to see who was visiting the White House, but now it is in fact online, which we can click if you want to kind of see. Again, I'll give you guys, we'll get all these links. And this is on the White House website, so um, I will give President Obama credit there that um, he has made certain attempts at being more transparent than, than past administrations. So you can see Gary Matthews, Patricia Doyle, um, that might be a fun research project for you all when you're sitting at home on your Saturday night, like me, doing research. Um, you might want to look up and find out who these people are that Obama's meeting with on a regular basis. But anyways, my point is, I have a point. <laughs> um, so when, um, when reporters had done the Freedom of Information request and they wanted to find out who was visiting the White House, of course, several of Obama's top donors were frequent visitors. And that's fine. I mean, he has every right to invite whoever he wants to to the White House, but when he made his whole campaign speech, super PACs inhibit democracy, I will not show favoritism, and then we come to find that all of his top donors are visiting the White House on a regular basis. Um, have, have you all been to the White House recently? C can you make a phone call or give a donation and, and end up in the White House? You know, it's, again, if he's gonna preach that you know, he doesn't show favoritism, then he needs to, um, he needs to walk by that. 
Okay, hometown, and I do need to cruise through these. How are we doing on time, Chris? Okay. Uh, so hometown, I wrote boy next door or city slicker. Uh, sometimes you have somebody who will really try to play up, let's say, you know, I came from an urban background and, you know, where I went to school there were metal detectors and, um, you know, I had a single mom and, you know, we, we had nothing growing up and look where I am now, I'm a self-made man. If that's a true story, more power to you. Um, you know, that's incredible character that you've built, it's going to help you through life. However, if you're exaggerating and you really didn't come from a terrible community, we want to expose that. So a great resource to you is Fact Finder, American Fact Finder. This is a project of the U.S. Census Bureau, and I always used to wonder, like, what good does the U.S. Census Bureau really do for us? I mean, I understand that they take census and that, you know, they give us population numbers and and that's all a good thing, but I really wondered, huh, I wonder what they do with all this information. Well, um, there's a resource to you called American Fact Finder, which is great, and you can go and pick a year and a community. You can get down to city, county, however specific you want to get, and you can look up things like community crime statistics. Okay, so what was the crime like here in Cincinnati back in 1992 versus what is the crime here in Cincinnati now in 2012? I think that makes an interesting comparison piece, you know? Um, certainly. Another thing you can look up on here is the average household income. So this would be an example where you could prove someone wrong. So, you know, that they say they grew up in a very poor community and you come to find when you do research that the average household income in that community was, you know, 80,000 or some ridiculous number, probably didn't grow up in a poor community. So this is a great way to kind of do some fact checking uh, on local communities. And I just think it's good for you, for those of you who've lived in Ohio your whole life, or if you lived in a specific community for 10, 20 years, I think it's just important to go back and look and say, well, where were we 10 years and where are we now? Are we a more prosperous community? Um, or are we, or are we um, uh, in a worse place economically? Okay, let's keep rolling. Money, where do they get their funding? Uh, unfortunately, we can't go through all of these today, but just real quickly, um, OpenSecrets.org is going to, how many of you guys have heard of Open Secrets? Good, hopefully a few of you, because it's just an incredible resource. It will give you federal campaign finance reports, very easy to, um, to research, so we'll click there in a minute, and then followthemoney.org. Uh, this will give you state reports on money and politics, so we will just go to followthemoney.org really quick, and I will just show you briefly um, what you can find. Let's go to National Overview. So here's the map. We are going to click on Ohio. Total dollars contributed to date, okay? Looks like 25 million. You can scroll down, Office of the Governor, House, Assembly, Senate. You guys want to do House or Senate? Senate. Click on the Senate, scroll down. Oops. Let's give it a second to think. Oh. There we go. Um, Senate candidates. And here's the, can you know, it'll give you the candidate and um, election status, how much money they've raised. This is a good one where you can really spend a lot of time clicking. Um, Want to do a Republican or a Democrat? Who can see up front? Anybody? Tim Schaefer, Paul Hall. Which one? See if I can find it. Jim Hughes, District 16? That's all right. Well, anyways, um, go to followthemoney.org, click on the map, click on Ohio, and you can start finding out where the money is being spent in state politics. A really great resource to you. Um, let's click on someone you can see what it looks like. So here would be an example. This is a um, Jim Hughes. It uh, looks like he's a Republican in the Senate in the 16th district. So if you scroll down, you can see everybody who's given money to him. Ohio Associ Education Association, right? The Columbus Firefighters Union, 
um, Laborers District Council of Ohio, uh, Ohio Civil Service Employees Association, plumbers and pipe fitters. So sometimes it's good to go in there, research who's giving them money, and maybe see if, if that has an influence on the way that they voted. Uh, this is a really, really great one. Okay. We will keep going, because um, I'm not gonna send you through all those. So the final resource that I'm gonna show you um, is called Reporter's Desktop, Who is John Doe? We're gonna click on it. And here's a whole long list, and I will include this link in the resource email that we send out to all of you, because it says who is John Doe and where to get the paper on him. And it gives you all these scenarios on people. So John Doe was born or married or died, and it shows you how to look up and find that document. John Doe bought, sold, or owns real estate. And it shows you where to click and where you can find the document and how to, sh and how to prove that. Um, he holds a professional license. Is he a doctor, a lawyer? Um, you know, does he, did he invent something where you can go to look up the patent? This, this provides links to you where you can find documents on just about everything depending on which person you're researching. So um, a great resource to you. Um, I'll make sure that you guys get all these links. So I'm gonna to go to questions because I've been doing a lot of talking, but uh, again, just to wrap up, I think the importance of doing strategic research and properly vetting candidates, public figures, organizations, you know, Occupy groups is, we wanna know who these people are. And the establishment media doesn't always do a good job. You know, I think we've seen that firsthand. And you know, again, if you're waiting for the government to tell you these things, you're gonna be waiting for forever. So it's up to us to be the eyes and ears to start doing research. There's so much available to you online for free. And if you have the time, you know, uh, if not you, then who? Um, thanks, I'm gonna move to questions. Like, who is John Doe? This would be 500 John Doe. Right, oh, that's just a, that's an example. But what it is is, it provides examples. So let's say it says if this person has a military record and there's several links to show you how you can get the document to find out if that person is active duty status, if they're a reservist, if they're National Guard, okay? And then remember this is kind of like when we're doing the, like a brainstorming session and you think, let's say on your list you say this person is a lawyer. You could go on that list and look and find a lawyer and it will show you where to look up you know, where they took the bar exam, you know, whether, that kind of thing. What I'm trying to find out personally is I have this planner from Warren County Regional Planning. Uh, he speaks with a, is he an accent like this? Okay. And his name is Stan Williams. Okay. That can't be his name. <laughs> it's not, I mean, maybe it's his name now, but it okay. I can't, I can find out where he went to school. Yeah, I would I start looking. He's an American. Okay. Well, some of that stuff is public record. Um, yep, yep, I would. Um, and you know what I should do is I should print out that sheet and start handing it out at sessions. I think that it would be a lot easier to understand and mental note to myself. Um, but yeah, a lot of times, you know, if this person had a name change, for example, you might be able to find it by looking up their academic record, finding out where they went to school. Um, is there a record of that person, Stan Williams, attending a school during those four years? If not, there might be an indication that he had a name change. Um, again, I would look at, you know, marriages, divorces. Sometimes people change names after a significant life change, like a divorce, for example. Um, so some of those links might help you in your research, but it can, it can certainly be tricky. Uh, you can go to the clerk of courts records and put in a name search and you'll find out if they get uh, either criminal or a uh, civil action. Oh, hold on, I'm gonna give you the mic here. Because everybody wants to hear this. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that you could go to the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. I'm, I imagine Butler County and other counties have it. And you can do a comprehensive name search on a person which would bring up either criminal or civil suits that they've been involved in. About five years ago, you were able to click on the document and actually read what the charges were and so forth. Uh, now they've got them all sealed, 
So you can't do it online, but if you go down to the courthouse, so if something piques your interest because it'll give you the caption like uh, disorderly conduct or spot, uh, domestic violence, whatever it would be, the title would be there, and then you'd have to go to the courthouse to pull the documents, but that can be very telling if you're looking for someone up. Definitely, court documents, what you can't find online, you can request an open, make an open record request, you can go down to the, um, go down and, and find a lot um, in your city and county buildings. Was there another question right here? Yeah, there's a lot of great information out there, and you might as well get as much as you can from free sources, but when you send out your summary of links and so forth, if there's a couple of good paid databases that you know of, we, I know I'd love to hear about Okay. Okay, so you're open to come talk to me afterward because I know about a couple of paid databases if you're willing to do kind of like a monthly subscription that are really helpful as well. But I try to keep it to all the free resources when we're doing the training sessions. When and where is the next session like this? <laughs> Ooh, I love that question. Um, we just did a tour through Ohio this week, so we have been to Toledo, Cleveland, and then today, Cincinnati. Um, so that wraps up our tour for now. We don't have another one planned, but that doesn't mean we can't come back. But what you can do for us is you can help us spread the word, because we have this incredible program, and I know several of you have come up to me and have been very appreciative and told me how much you really enjoyed the program, and yet we had about 35 people total here today. And so... We need help spreading the word, and if um, if you all would would help us do that by you know going to Watched Up Wire on Facebook and liking us, what we'll do is we'll all the photos that we took today we'll post on there. So if you want to go and find the photos and tag yourself, you can do that. Um, if you go also go to WatchedUpWire.com, uh, there's a resource page, and I'm gonna click there. Actually. It should be up already. Oh, awesome! Hang on. But I have so many. But your million tabs. I know. I lost. It's probably like faster to just. Aha, okay. So this is watchdogwire.com. Look at that, Ohio. See, we've got a whole big pop-up just specified for you guys because we've been here all week. If you click the resources tab, you've got investigative reporting tools here. And a lot of the links that we went over, the FOIA letter generator, okay, open secrets, you can see is on there. Um, we have a lot of resources there. You can also click on um, Open Records Law, and the Open Records Law for every state is listed. What else? State Auditors. We didn't talk a whole lot about state auditors today, um, but that is it. Uh, reading through those audit reports does get you a lot of information and uh, certainly a lot of investigative leads. So um, check out watch.wire.com, a lot of great information. Um, the great thing about this is it's also, um, it is an online platform for you. So if you go in and start an account, you can post your stories. If you have links, if you have video, let's say you record um, your local town hall meeting and you want other people in your community to see the town hall meeting, you can post the video up on here and you can sort by state. So there is just a specific Ohio page where you all can go and become citizen watchdogs and you can contribute regularly. I would say a really good starting point is to go to the Ohio Auditor's website and type in the name of your community or school district, whatever it is you want to have information on, and uh, you'll be able to pull up those last audits, and usually there's five, six years there. But each time I've ever sent an email to whatever the contact person and asked them to provide management letters, bingo, I had them the next day. I mean, it's like in a heartbeat they sent them. On the state auditor website? Yeah. And then the other thing Let's is, go to it. Uh, if people know that there are these Sunshine Law seminars that the state auditor and the uh, attorney general put on, every elected official is required to take one, one of these courses once within their term of office. So typically the election's held in November, so there's going to be seminars probably in December or January, and you can attend for free. Great. And that's hosted by Ohio. Um. The, if, if you go to the, well, you can type in Sunshine Law or the Ohio um, Secretary of State and the auditor. It's the, those two. Well, here's the Ohio Auditor of State website that I have up here for you. Um, and they'll post reports, audit reports, pretty regularly. So if you're looking for a big document to research and kind of find out um, what's happening with spending and whatnot, that would be a good place to look.
Any other questions? Great. All right. Well, thanks for letting me talk at you guys. Um. <laughs>